This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Health officials in Gaza say Israel's unrelenting bombardment of the besieged Palestinian territory has killed another 700 people over the past 24 hours, bringing the death toll over the past 18 days to more than 5,800 Palestinians. Among them, 2,000 children are dead. 1.4 million Gazans, more than half of the territory's population, has been displaced. Many say there's no safe place to be in Gaza right now. The World Health Organization's pleading for far more aid to be allowed into Gaza through the Rafah border, crossing with Egypt. We're going to look now at Egypt's response to Israel's bombardment of Gaza and the negotiations over aid coming through Rafah. We're joined by Sharif Dokudus, independent journalist working with the Egyptian news outlet Mata Masser. He won a George Polk Award for his Al Jazeera documentary, The Killing of Shireen Abu Akla. His latest piece for The Guardian is headlined, Israel's endgame is to push Palestinians into Egypt and the West is cheering on. Sharif, welcome back to Democracy Now! Um, can you talk about all that's taking place right now around the Rafah border crossing and explain who it's controlled by um, and explain what Israel is calling on Egypt to do? Thank you, Amy. I think, well, first of all, we have to understand Egypt is the only country other than Israel uh, to share a border crossing uh, with Gaza. And um, what we've seen since uh, October 7th is um, a lot of negotiations around what's going to happen at this border crossing. So as it stands right now, um, Egypt has insisted on allowing humanitarian aid uh, into Gaza and uh, has allowed multiple countries to deliver aid to Arish um, in northern Sinai, countries like Jordan, Turkey, uh, Qatar, uh, the UAE have uh, delivered uh, uh, thousands of tons of humanitarian aid uh, that are kind of idling in these trucks uh, at the border. Um, so far since Saturday, something like uh, 75 or 80 trucks have been allowed in, about 20 trucks a day after a lot of negotiations. Uh, 20 trucks a day are being allowed in uh, by Israel into Gaza. And this is um, nowhere near enough. You know, according to humanitarian uh, organizations, uh, they've called it a drop in the ocean. And just to give you a sense, uh, 20 trucks a day amounts to about 4% of an average day's imports before October 7th, before um, 1.4 million people were dis displaced, before 15,000 people uh, were uh, injured, before, uh, you know, uh, close to 6,000 people were killed. So, um, the, you know, the UN is saying that hundreds of trucks a day uh, are needed. And on top of that, Israel has placed heavy restrictions uh, on that, even that minuscule aid uh, that's coming in. Well, firstly, uh, you know, Israel has bombed the Gaza side of the Rafah border crossing uh, four times since um, October 7th, even one time slamming uh, into Egyptian territory um, uh, at the border. But the aid, when it comes in, it travels to the uh, Auga Nazana border crossing with Israel, where it's first inspected by um, Israeli authorities. And then it eventually uh, gets into, uh, goes back to the Rafah border crossing and goes into uh, Gaza. Uh, this is a process that takes many hours. Um, but I think we have to understand that there's two issues that really stand out on the restrictions. First of all, all deliveries of aid to northern Gaza are prohibited. So none of this minuscule, even this like paltry amount of aid is getting to northern Gaza. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands have evacuated from northern Gaza after Israel warned people uh, to leave, but there's still hundreds of thousands that remain. And just to give you a sense, uh, the, the biggest hospital in Gaza is in Gaza City, uh, Shifa Hospital. Uh, this is a hospital that usually in normal times has a capacity of about 700 patients. Um, it's currently overwhelmed with 5,000 patients. And you have something like 45,000 displaced people gathered in and around the hospital grounds seeking shelter. Uh, that's according to the UN. And none of the aid that's coming in is getting to them. But secondly, uh, and very importantly, the aid that is coming in, none of it includes any fuel. Fuel is not being allowed to, to enter. And fuel is just absolutely crucial for so many things, uh, perhaps most importantly for electricity, to run generators. And without fuel, 
uh, life-saving medical equipment, uh, like incubators, ventilators, um, uh, won't work. And so this spells a death sentence for, for babies in neonatal wards and things like this. So one official has called it, you know, uh, that the aid coming in is more of a diplomatic symbol rather than actual meeting any humanitarian needs. Um, but, uh, but we have to see where this is going. And Sharif, I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, what, on the water situation, could you, is all water still cut off by, uh, by the Israelis? And, and secondly, isn't the whole issue of uh, Israel urging people to leave, uh, to leave Gaza through Egypt uh, a clear sample of ethnic cleansing after all? Israel has many uh, uh, many entrances on its side uh, of the Gaza Strip where it could allow women and children to come out of uh, northern Gaza, possibly even even bust them into the West Bank. But they're clearly trying to get rid of the Palestinians, as many as possible, uh, from their occupied territories. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, first of all, an issue of, of water. And people have talked about there's the, uh, a real risk of dehydration to death. Uh, people are drinking now dirty water. Uh, the aid that's coming in is not enough. You know, the first day it, it, it uh, provided water for about 22,000 people for a few hours. Um, and we're talking about a, a place which has 2.3 million people and no water has been allowed in uh, since October 7th. No aid at all has been allowed in except for these small convoys. Um, there has been a, a water pipeline that was... Uh, uh, that is supposedly working near Khan Yunus, but it's not nearly providing enough. And yes, this idea of, so first of all, this order comes down from Israel. Well, first of all, Netanyahu, when this all began on October 7th, took to the airwaves announcing a war against Hamas and telling people in Gaza to leave now, you know, and uh, saying, you know, he left unsaid where they're supposed to go. But then there was this order to evacuate to the south um, 1.1 million people were supposed to evacuate within 24 hours. And you see this kind of push uh, towards the Egyptian border. And uh, from what we understand, reporting uh, through Madamas, that Egyptian sources have told us that uh, in those days, in the, in the beginning at least, there was a lot of pressure and continuing for Egypt to open uh, the Rafah border crossing to create a so-called humanitarian corridor and to allow for the forcible displacement of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from Gaza into northern Sinai. And that instead of the United States and other Western countries pressuring Israel for a ceasefire, pressuring Israel to create, um, to allow in the necessary amount of aid, they have instead been pressuring Egypt to open the border and allow for this mass displacement and have been offering economic incentives uh, to Egypt to do so. We have to remember Egypt is undergoing a very severe economic crisis with a massive amount of debt, with record high inflation. And so, uh, you know, there's been talk of, uh, of debt relief, of financial compensation uh, in order to allow for this, uh, for this kind of displacement. Now, Egypt's response has been kind of very staunch on this, actually. Uh, the president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, has very publicly rejected this idea uh, of having um, a, a form of ethnic cleansing and um, a forced displacement and exile into Sinai. Uh, he has uh, cited Egypt's sovereignty in this. He has cited the Palestinian cause uh, in all of this. He has even, um, you know, is drumming up and is riding a wave of public support for this because, uh, you know, this is a, the Palestine, as we heard from Rami Khouri, is a, is, a, is a touchstone issue for so many across the Arab world, for so many across the, the global south. And this idea of what they call a second Nakba, a second catastrophe and a second mass displacement is firmly rejected. So even Sisi called for protests on Friday for people to take to the streets. And people did in Cairo and Alexandria and, and other places. Although some people, you know, carried on those protests into Tahrir. Some were chanting revolutionary chants. And uh, we haven't seen that for, for many years. And actually, Egyptian authorities have arrested over 100 people uh, because of that. But, you know, I think many see Sisi's stance as laudable, uh, rejecting what is essentially an endorsement of a second Nakba. But I think we have to remember that, uh, you know, him citing the Palestinian cause really rings hollow. And we have to remember that Egypt, uh, its concerns really are national security concerns. 
uh, not wanting to have a, uh, a mass population of Palestinians who could, uh, you know, launch attacks against Israel from northern Sinai and not having to deal with the refugee crisis. Egypt, after all, has helped enforce the siege on Gaza for many years. It destroyed the tunnels that provided a lifeline to Gaza. It has allied with Israel in many different ways in security coordination. It has allowed Israel to conduct a covert um, air campaign, aerial bombing campaign in Sinai. Um, so, and it also treats Palestinians coming in and out of Gaza notoriously with, with indignity. But, uh, but so far, this idea of rejecting uh, this kind of, um, this kind of uh, mass exodus uh, I think a lot of people are, are supportive of that of that policy and instead trying to pressure Israel to allow humanitarian aid in. Ultimately, uh, Sharif, is it Israel, is it Hamas, is it Egypt? Um, who is preventing that aid? As you said, we're seeing dozens of trucks now after weeks of not having anything, when, in fact, they're talking about the need is something like 400 to 500 trucks a day. And also, when it comes to what happened this weekend in Cairo, the so-called peace summit of Arab leaders, what did they come up with? Well, the peace summit didn't actually come up with anything. There wasn't a joint statement that was signed. Uh, Sisi and uh, King Abdullah and others repeated uh, condemnations of um, Israel's bombing of Israel's siege on Gaza, and Sisi again rejected this idea of a mass displacement uh, to Sinai. And I think, you know, we have to also understand that um, this idea of resettling Palestinians in Gaza to Sinai is not a new one. It's actually an old colonial fantasy. There has been numerous plans by Israel um, and others uh, of this idea of resettling the Palestinians in Gaza, who 80% of which are refugees, by the way, who are refugees from 1948, uh, of resettling them uh, again uh, into Egypt. Um, in the, in the mid-1950s, the UN devised a plan for this kind of mass uh, resettlement, and it was met with a popular outrage uh, in Gaza and kind we of crushed in a, in a popular uprising. Um, so, I mean, these, these kinds of plans are longstanding, um, and there's, there's a real fear that they will be realized. But for, for now, we have to see uh, Egypt is rejecting it, but Israel is creating a situation where uh, life is becoming unlivable in Gaza. Sharif Abdel Kadus, independent journalist working with the Egyptian news outlet Mada Maser, produced the award winning documentary The Killing of Shireen Abu Akhla about the Palestinian American journalist. Uh, we will link to your piece in The Guardian. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.